Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. Context of white supremacy. Justice, Gus T. Renegade, in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Sunday, July 21st, 2013. So I have been told uh, we will be back tomorrow. Uh, we'll be back to our regular broadcast time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, and 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, tune in tomorrow. I'll give out the details before we conclude the program today. Always a pleasure to have our guest joining us. Uh, I was checking back to double make sure I had all the information correct in the description and the title for today's broadcast. And uh, it is indeed her 19th time visiting us and I say that hopefully to uh, make sure that we are appreciating how generous she has been to come and speak with us speak with us so frequently hopefully we're building on that information uh, not just having it go in our brain computer and seat back out and not really thinking about it grasping what's being said and applying that as we see fit to the way that we think speak and act uh, racism has been a huge topic uh, for the duration of this, really for the duration of this year. Folks, remember the last time she was with us, we were talking about Christopher Dorner. I think that also has been one of the biggest stories of this year, also directly about the system of white supremacy. Our guest, third generation physician, general and child psychiatrist, author of the ISIS papers, The Keys to the Colors. She was also in the documentary film. Hidden Colors, Tariq Nasheed, always a pleasure to have her on the broadcast, uh, get great information at a time when a lot of us are feeling, I think, a little frustrated and angry about how things have been progressing the past few weeks. Joining us live from Washington, D.C., our guest, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Dr. Welsing, are you with us? Yes, I am. Very glad to be with you again. Thank you so much for sharing some of your time. Uh, you have been doing, uh, as you told me when we spoke earlier this week, you've been doing a lot of interviews, obviously a lot of people talking about racism, white supremacy, and for all the folks who have heard you uh, through the years when you have visited us here on the cows, uh, just thank you so much for being so gracious, not just with us, but with so many uh, victims of racism who appreciate uh, you taking time out of your schedule to share some of your thoughts and views on the system of racism. Give us a little bit of encouragement. I think even back in 2009, you visited with us and uh, you concluded saying, be not discouraged. And that has been a refrain here on the program to not get too depressed or sad, to persevere, keep going uh, to replace the system of white supremacy with justice. Uh, how are you doing today, Dr. Welsing? I'm sorry. I said, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing fair. I'm doing okay. Right on. Right on. Always dealing with some aspect of the system of racism, white supremacy, as Neely Fuller says, it's the longest war. And uh, the more we get accustomed to, because nobody likes to be at war, uh, but when war is being brought against you, uh, and you have to, out of your self-respect, respond to it. So I think the sooner we get accustomed to understanding racism, white supremacy as a total system structure and as warfare uh, being conducted against black people, uh, the more we get accustomed to understanding that and really understanding how best we should respond to this onslaught uh, without getting discouraged. But to, you know, to get discouraged is human. To get frustrated is human. And uh, But we have to get knocked down and decide that you get up again and you continue to pursue because your self-respect demands this of us. Mm. Well said. Uh, before we get to uh, the things that have happened more recently with the acquittal of George Zimmerman, 
I wanted to pick up a question because some of the listeners, they were really curious to know if, if you had come to a conclusion on this. As I said, the last time you visited with us in February of this year, the major news story was Christopher Dorner. And at the time that we spoke, uh, he had not been, he was not deceased. Uh, he was still, as they reported, on the loose. And when we were discussing that matter, uh, you pointed out critical aspect that he was alleged to have killed two non-white individuals, a black male, a non-white female. And we were discussing uh, that's just not constructive and that non-white people are harmed anyway. We really should try and be doing things in response to racism, white supremacy that do not result in additional harm to non-white people, black people. And I asked if it would be an act of black self-respect to report Mr. Dorner if, you know, you had any information on him, even given that this is a black male and he was saying that, hey, he was having a problem with racism. That was what motivated what he was doing. Uh, and given everything about enforcement officers, police brutality, racist police officers, would that be an act of black self-respect to report him? And you said you'd have to think about it a little bit. I just was curious if, if, if you had a moment to give it more thought, uh, what your views on that would be now? Well, uh, I can't really think of a situation. In other words, if someone were to uh, make a report, it would mean that they would have to have knowledge of what it is that the individual was doing or planning to do. So I don't know how you would make a report if you did not have knowledge. And then if the question is like if the person did have knowledge, then the question would be what exactly is it that they are attempting to achieve by making a report? To whom would they make the report? So those are just some of the questions that the person uh, might want to ask themselves. If it, I think at the time they were asking people if they saw him or saw someone that looked like him, if you thought you knew his whereabouts at that time, would that be something, would that be an act of black self-respect to say, hey, I think I saw this person over here. I'm going to go ahead and call the enforcement officials to let them know that I think the suspect is here, even though it was Christopher Dorn in this case who was saying, I'm a victim of racism. This is a response to racism, white supremacy. Well, again, in other words, uh, what are they, what are they what are they reporting? Uh, is the person going to harm another black person? If the person was going to harm another black person, then to make that make that report, that would you know, of course, be up to the person's judgment. But you would have to ask yourself. Uh, am I snitching for reasons of personal gain? What exactly is my objective? You see, because black people, during formal enslavement, black people were programmed and paid. You know, in other words, Master Francis is talking about racism. I mean, that slavery is bad. And so the master would say, oh, is that right, Mandy? And Mandy would say, yes, Master. She was talking to some other of the slaves and talking about resisting. So then the master would say, fine, you've done a good job, Mandy, and I'm going to give you two extra pieces of fat back. Now, is that what? In other words, the total context of what exactly is it that the person wants to do? Because we have been first of all, program to not respect ourselves and not respect one another. And so we want to raise the question, is this what is operational? Mm. Right on. Glad we got the follow-up on that. Um, moving to more current matters, obviously, I think the most discussed topic for at least the last month, if not longer, has been uh, the trial now acquittal of George Zimmerman uh, and the killing of Trayvon Martin, unarmed uh, teenage black male. Uh, most recently now, President Obama coming out on Friday and giving about a 17 minute talk on racism, what happened with the verdict. Uh, when I called on Friday, you were getting the information and I interrupted your studies on this matter. Uh, what were your thoughts on what President Obama had to say this past Friday? 
Well, <clears throat> excuse me, first and foremost, I was pleased that the president did come out and make a statement about racism. I mean, I think this is the first time since before he became president that he has specifically addressed the issue of racism, and he made it personal about what uh, he has in the past experienced as a black man and what he knows other black men have experienced in terms of uh, being stopped when one as a black person, as a black man, is shopping. And so he made it very personal, and <clears throat> he said it could have been him uh, 30, 35 years ago. And I thought to myself, well, it's it's you today. <laughs> you see, in terms of the levels of disrespect that the president is shown, higher levels of disrespect than any other president, higher uh, levels of death threats than any other president. And to have people call him a liar at the State of the Union address and also to um, have people openly say, we want to see him fail and we're going to be working to see that he fails and working to see that he's a one-term president. But I'm very pleased that uh, the president did put the topic of racism on the table for discussion. And I think it's up to us as black people to, now that he's put it on the table, black people must nail it down to the top of the table so that this is the topic that we are talking about 24-7. And again, to be reminded that we are in a total system construct <coughs> excuse me, of racism and white supremacy. And we will be befuddled, as Neely Fuller says, if you don't understand white supremacy racism, what it is and exactly how it works. Everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you. And I say this is why we greet each other by saying, hey, what's happening? Because we're moving around trying to figure out why is it that we are not making the progress that we would like to see ourselves make? And the more we understand racism, white supremacy as a total system, what its goal objective is, the more effective we will be in our functioning so that we don't have to just plead and beg for other people to do certain things with their behavior, we will know exactly and specifically what to do with our behavior to checkmate racism, white supremacy uh, on the local national stage and also contribute to its demise on the world stage by replacing it with a system of justice. So hopefully there could be peace on the planet. There are... I've heard a lot of white people, and I expected this. Uh, I remember, I think, when he spoke, President Obama, when he made the comments after Dr. Henry Louis Gates was arrested in his own house, uh, when he said that, you know, ra the officer acted stupidly and he talked about racism being a problem, racial profiling, that a lot of white people were upset about those comments. Uh, even in April of last year, when the reporter asked him about uh, the Trayvon Martin case and he said if he had a son, Trayvon Martin, his son would look like Trayvon Martin. A lot right. of white people were furious about that and saying that he was race baiting and what have you. Uh, similar response, what I expected uh, when he gave his remarks on Friday. Uh, in fact, on one website, they had nearly a half million comments uh, and a vast number of them, white people making all sorts of just tacky, racist comments, uh, calling him names and what have you. However, I also saw a lot of victims of racism uh, who were also upset. Uh, some of the things they were saying that he, he should have done this sooner. Uh, he should have said something as soon as the verdict came out. He should have been more aggressive with what he said. They didn't feel like he was explicit enough with regards to labeling uh, the problem as racism, white supremacy, as a total world system. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Tavis Smiley, who's also black male, 
Uh, he said that the speech was uh, weak as pre-sweetened Kool-Aid. And one of our former guests, even, uh, who's also a black male, he's a journalist uh, named Rich Benjamin, journalist and author. Uh, he wrote uh, he was comparing what President Obama said to what Attorney General Eric Holder said when he gave his talk on the verdict at the uh, NAACP convention. Uh, he wrote, this is Rich Benjamin, he wrote, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder delivered trenchant thoughts on the acquittal demanding action before an audience of supporters. Holder recently called for a full investigation of Martin's death after Zimmerman's acquittal. Holder vowed that the Justice Department will act in a manner that is consistent with the facts and the law. We will not be afraid. We must stand our ground, he told supporters. Some of us have an inner child. Others have an inner nigger. Is Holder the president's conscience or his inner nigger? This is a response from Rich Benjamin, black male. Uh, I just wanted your thoughts with regards to any black people, non-white people who are frustrated, angry about President Obama's speech. What would your comments be to them? Well, one of the things that I would say is how many black people who are making the criticism of the president, uh, I would just have them look in the mirror and say, how much time have I spent in the last week, the last month, the last year, myself talking about racism, white supremacy as a system? Do, do you see? And I'm just saying, in other words, uh, the job of the president is not to solve the problem of racism. He won't be able to solve the job, the problem of racism by himself, even though I think it was wonderful and very significant and important that he did address the issue of racism. But the, I would say 90% of black people at this point in time still don't want themselves to talk about racism. Don't want to talk about racism, white supremacy. So this covers this covers the vast majority of us. People are afraid to talk about the racism that they encounter on their jobs. Now we don't have any problem attacking each other. But we need to begin to see that we are at a chessboard, and we are the players on the black side of the chessboard. The white side of the chessboard are people who classify themselves as white, whether they're Republican, so-called conservative, or whether they're liberals. They're playing the white side of the chessboard, and our position is on the black side of the chessboard. So at the 90% level of black people, do we see ourselves manning the black side of the chessboard? Or are we saying, oh, those people who always talk about racism, why does Francis Welsing always talk about racism? <laughs> do you see? So we are not as a mass, as a group of people at a critical mass level. We're not talking about racism. Now, I want, would want to encourage us to get in that position. Why? Because racism, white supremacy, has been attacking us for the last 500 years in this area of the world. And to the extent that we have been made afraid to talk about racism. We all know if a black person mentions racism, fortunately the president pulled the door open a little bit of crack so that people could feel more comfortable talking about racism. But if a black person mentions racism on the television, then immediately a person who classifies him or herself as white will start screaming, you're playing the race card. And we're not going to, no, 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 oh, no, no, there you go, playing the race card. And so shut up. I was even interested in how many programs started having Tim Wise talk about racism as opposed to, let's say, a Neely Fuller. 
so that racism can only be talked about. I saw a couple of shows earlier today, and the black people, they were just given a few minutes to mumble a few things, and then the, the host would turn the discussion around in another direction. And they have started sliding from talking about racism to talking about race. They see, in other words, well, let's talk about race. And then next week, they'll be saying, well, there's no such thing as race. To get people away from talking about racism as white supremacy and as a total system structure. So I'm just saying that to say we have not, as a collective of people, we have not found at the critical mass level the courage to talk about this difficult subject. Because if you bring it up on the job, the next thing you have to know, are you setting yourself up for not getting a promotion? Are you setting yourself up for getting a pink slip? See, in a system of racism, the last thing that the people who classify themselves want to hear is anybody talking about their behavior and white behavior responsibility. See, they can talk for days about what black people ought to be doing with their behavior and they ought to be responsible in terms of what they eat because they're overweight or how they are behaving as fathers and husbands or what they are doing you know, on and on and on about what black people ought to take responsibility for. When have we heard major discussion about the behavior responsibility of people who classify themselves as white? And what I'm saying now is that we are in a system of racism, white supremacy, and it is a destructive system but it is a system for white genetic survival. So people have heard me say it is a conscious and or subconscious structured system for white genetic survival that controls patterns of perception, logic, symbol formation, thought, speech, action, and emotional response as played out in all areas of people's activity economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. For the ultimate purpose of white genetic survival and preventing white genetic annihilation on planet Earth, a planet upon which the vast and overwhelming majority of people are classified as non-white, meaning black, brown, red, and yellow by white-skinned people, and all of the non-white people are genetically dominant in terms of skin coloration compared to genetic recessive white-skinned people. Now, this is what is going on on this planet. And the sooner we get a critical mass of people who, if they use the word racism, they say, this is what it is. Because when you use a term, use a word, if you don't follow that up with your definition, the person that you're talking to can give it their own definition and have the discussion going in their direction. And so, in my view, if I could wave a magic wand this evening, I would have the vast majority of black people in this area of the world and then go from there to throughout the world talking about system of racism, white supremacy. That's what exists in reality. And democracy, if that means everybody's equal and everybody has equal opportunity, that's a nice whoosh. That's a nice ideal, but that is not what exists. What exists is a local, national, global system of racism, white supremacy. And that's why Trayvon Martin was killed. We have a person who classified himself as white, who sees a black male, a young black male. He's armed, and he, the white person is armed and has a gun. He decides that he... He may have the right to carry a gun, 
but he doesn't have a right to accost the young black man after thinking that he's a criminal when he's just a child coming home from the store, rushing back home to watch a football game or something like that. And so that mindset that black male is dangerous is a fundamental perception, conscious and or subconscious, on the part of people who classify themselves as white in the system of racism, white supremacy. And the reason for that is because black males have the potential to cause white genetic annihilation because of their genetic, dominant genetic material. That's not to say that any black man is going to make it his business to cause white genetic annihilation, but the potential is there. And so the system attacks black people in general and black men in particular because women cannot impose sexual intercourse whether they're white, black, brown, red, or yellow. Women cannot impose sexual intercourse. Males, whether they're white, black, brown, red, or yellow, can impose sexual intercourse. So the thrust for white genetic survival or the push or the desire or the determination for white genetic survival means that they have to focus on and cripple black male functioning, either kill them, lynch them, castrate them, or lock them up and make them dysfunctional. And that's what the whole stop and frisk, stop, you know, for minor so-called drug uh, possessions, give them a record, put them in jail. So when they come out, they can't vote. They can't get housing. They can't get a job. They can't play the role of husband and father. And so then you basically have black people on a genocide slide. Because if you cripple the functioning of men en masse, then you have put the people in a status of genocide. And any group of people who are fearful of their genetic annihilation will consciously and or subconsciously move to cause genocide of the people that they fear. And this is why we hear the refrain over and over again, I thought he had a weapon. 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 Well, the black man doesn't have a gun or a knife. What he has in his genital apparatus is the genetic material that can cause white genetic annihilation. Now, I say this is the strongest card that we have in our play deck, that labeling, not hating white people, that's a complete waste of time and energy. It's cheap. But to say we now are understanding why you have historically and into the present related to black people in the way that you have related. Now we understand your fear. Now we know what to expect from you in your behavior in all areas of people activity, thought, speech, action, emotional response. We know what to expect because the end product is always white genetic survival or prevent white genetic annihilation by any and all necessary means. Now, I say that if we get into that position where we are able to calmly articulate after all of these centuries of being enslaved, being uh, under Jim Crow laws, being segregated, discriminated against up to the present time, where people are still in segregated schools and poor schools, can't get health care, can't get housing, on and on and on. You see, but at least we will now, everybody can then become a leader because everybody understands what the problem is. 
And so everybody at an individual level can begin to think through, well, so therefore, what is it that I'm going to do with my behavior? And we can start with some of the behaviors that Neely Fuller has laid out in his textbook for victims of racism, white supremacy. And when you think about these these ten behaviors that I'm going to initially suggest, you will see that it would be a major solution. Neely Fuller calls these behaviors ten stops of counter-racism. And if we engage in these behaviors, our self and group respect score will go up. I call them exercises in black mental health and black self-respect and creating a culture of counter-racism. And the behaviors are stop name-calling one another, stop cursing one another, stop gossiping about one another, stop squabbling with one another, stop being discourteous and disrespectful to one another, stop stealing from one another, stop robbing one another, Stop fighting one another. Stop killing one another. Now, imagine, Neely Fuller has been saying this. I met him in 1967, and he was saying that then. Imagine if everybody got on board, so to speak. You know, it's wonderful. Everybody got on board. Large numbers of people got on board and marched in behalf of Trayvon and talking about stopping racism. Fine. But what do you do when you get home from the march beyond put your feet in some warm water, sit down and rest? If we knew that the practice of these behaviors begins to shift the power of the system of racism, white supremacy, how so? Because the system of white supremacy can only flourish as long as the majority non-white people, and let's just take ourselves as black people, it can flourish and strengthen as long as we hate ourselves and hate one another and are disrespectful to ourselves and disrespectful to one another. But the minute we begin to change that, how we perceive ourselves, and how we perceive one another, and step into a higher level of self-respect, that begins to weaken the structural dynamic of racism, white supremacy. Because people who classify themselves as white are fewer than one-tenth of the people on the planet. Nine-tenths of the people are black, brown, red, and yellow. And so since white supremacy established itself in global dominance, controlling all of the non-white people. And the first thing they're taught is to hate themselves and to start wishing they were white and give them a white God so they will always be worshiping the white image. So when people begin to understand that, so that the nine-tenths, of the non-white people because they have been taught to hate themselves and want to be white. They shift power that could belong to them. They shift it to hating themselves and upholding racism and white supremacy. So people can control that. Just thinking about those behaviors that Neely Fuller recommended. See, stop squabbling with one another. Stop cursing one another. Stop being discourteous and disrespectful. Now, black people are always talking about doing business with other black people. What if we are discourteous and disrespectful to the people who come to our business? What if we don't treat them with the highest level of respect? Then how can the business flourish? So if we begin to think about In fact, I'm even suggesting instead of getting upset and getting high blood pressure and having a heart attack, if the Justice Department decides that they're not going to prosecute 
uh, George Zimmerman again, that black people, if they wanted to have a response, they could just say, well, this means that out of our respect for ourselves as black people, it's no spending at Halloween, it's no buying turkeys at Thanksgiving, it's no buying Christmas trees or presents. Black people are just going to close their fist on their money and put it in their savings account and say that it's Operation Black Justice. So people don't have to wonder, what is somebody else going to do? Yeah, that's an important question. We will see whether the system of racism, white supremacy, can come forth in this particular situation with a product called justice. But the system has historically not responded. Do you see? But one of the big things that black people accomplished was during the civil rights era when uh, Rosa Parks said, I'm not going to get up out of this seat in Montgomery, Alabama and give the seat to a white person. I'm not going to support white supremacy. So then what? They took her to jail and arrested her, but the black people said they are going to boycott the buses. And the buses went out of business. And the next thing, the laws were changed. Now, I say that the weakness of our situation at this time is that we thought our analysis as black people was all we need to do is change the laws and everything will be all right. Well, in a total system structure that has a critical ultimate goal objective, See, it's, it's like if people were just doing something, well, let me just, you know, have segregation on the buses for no reason at all. I just think I'll have segregation on the buses. Then that would not be strong. But if we're going to have segregation on the buses and other kinds of laws and prohibit voting because we do not want to be genetically annihilated, as people who classify themselves as white because we are a minority. And people in this, white people in this area of the world, uh, a couple of weeks ago, an article came out about more white deaths than births. And in a short period of time, they're going to be a minority in this area of the world. And so the people who classify themselves as white consciously, subconsciously, are getting themselves ready with stand their ground, stand your ground laws that black people can't use. So if Trayvon, you know, God forbid, he's a child, if he had a gun and this white man moved to attack him and Trayvon shot him, do you think that they would let Trayvon go and on stand your ground? No. That would not happen. So, again, I'm just saying to us, if we, it's just like if you sit down at the chessboard and you really don't know the game and you say, hey, what's happening? And the other person says, this is a chessboard. The game is chess. This is what the game is all about. This is how you play the game. Then the person can say, oh, I thought it was a checkerboard. They say it's the same board, but it's chess. And these are the rules for chess. The goal objective in the game of chess is for the white king to checkmate the black king. And so then the person says, oh, very good. Uh, now I'm beginning to understand what the game is what is really happening. So let's play, and let me increase my skills as I play over and over again until I master the game. Now that's what we need to be able to do. Take our understanding of racism, white supremacy, to another level. And one of the things that I'm recommending to people 
the system of racism teaches people of color. And it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. It doesn't matter what language you speak. The system of racism, white supremacy, teaches. If you are black, get back. If you are brown, stick around. If you are yellow, you're mellow. And if you're white, you're all right. Now, heretofore, black people learned that before they learned how to read. Newborn babies learn it the minute the first family member sees the baby because they're checking what color is it, what shade of black is it. If it's too black, then the family rejects the baby. But because this color scheme and color code was set up because the people who have the blackest skins have the greatest genetic potential to cause white genetic annihilation. That's why that color code exists. And one of the things that we can do that will produce a magical result, if black people say, well, we're going to start doing is putting the blackest black at the top of the scale of respect, that this is what we looked like before our grandmothers, great-grandmothers were raped in formal slavery. So all of the colors are going to be okay. Not going to make fun of any color, but we're going to put crystal black at the highest level of our respect. Right now, a psychiatrist such as myself will have a mother bring a daughter, call her, Dr. Wilson, I need to talk to you about my daughter because my daughter says she's going to kill herself. And taking the history, the person said, my daughter wants to kill herself because the boys tell her she's too dark to date. So they got black people using bleaching screens all over Africa, all over the United States, all over Central and South America, all over Asia as a manifestation of the system of racism, white supremacy, teaching that white is beautiful and black is ugly. Just like people thinking that they have to have all kind of long, straight hair falling off their heads so that they will look closer to white. So we have to embrace ourselves and respect ourselves and understand and say this is fascinating how the system of racism, white supremacy has shaped our behavior. Shaped the behavior of the people who come up with these rap songs that demean color. And have black people singing and dancing and having black people call themselves niggers and gangsters and thugs and bitches and hoes. Then when, when George Zimmerman says they're criminals, we want to get upset. But what have we been calling ourselves? What have we been programmed? Because these so-called artists are paid high money, millions of dollars, by the system of racism and white supremacy to propagate these negative thoughts onto black people. The artists don't understand racism and white supremacy. The people who pick up the language and dance and whatnot to that trashy, destructive communication, that stuff goes inside of a person's brain. And because it goes in on a beat, it's hard to get that out of the brain if a person was really thinking about it. So these are the things that we have to begin to understand. And let me just share some of the other stops that I add to Mr. Fuller's list of ten. I say stop using and selling drugs to one another. Stop black children from thinking that as children they can be adequate mothers and fathers. Black people need to be 30 years old before they think about reproducing under the conditions of war, of racism, white supremacy. Because if somebody's a teenager, they haven't learned how to take care of themselves, they haven't finished school, and yet they're going to make a baby. Shortly after the baby gets here, they're going to be overwhelmed. 
and then they're going to give the baby up to foster care or pass the baby around to a hundred different relatives. In the meantime, the baby, because of all of that instability, is becoming crazy. And when it com comes time to go to school, the child is not ready to learn because its security has been chaotic. And so it's not a matter of blaming any teenage person who's having sex. This culture teaches sex. Just turn on the TV. And you see Cialis or some drug to increase one's sexual functioning. Don't misunderstand me. Sex is fabulous and important in the appropriate time, in place, and under the appropriate conditions. But I say when people play with sex and they produce children, the joke is on the offspring. The joke is on the child because it's a terrible experience for a child to be separated from its parents or for the parents to be in a situation where they are not able to really take care of the baby. And all of the black children that are sent off to foster care, it's no different than when we were in formal slavery, where the slave masters would have us breed, just breed indiscriminately. And then the slave master would take the child and sell the child to another plantation. And then the child would be sold over and over again. So we are, because we don't understand the system, slavery was an aspect of the system of racism, white supremacy. That's why... In slavery, on the slave ships, we were in chains. And then look at all the black men that have chains around their waists and chains around their ankles and chains around their wrists. On the prison plantation. So we have to think about, are we breeding to support the prison industrial complex and institution in the system of racism, white supremacy. So we have a lot to think about, but if we think about the fact that the creator of the universe made black people the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet, including white people. White people are a mutation to albinism, which is a genetic deficiency state, not said so by Francis Welsey. This is in the formal field and study of genetics. So we are the parent people of the planet. And so I say that the creator of the universe expects something from us. It expects us to get the house in order. And so when black people start thinking about countering racism and producing justice so there can be peace, then we are carrying out the function, I believe, that the creative force in the universe intended for us to engage in. But we can't look at it and, you know, a few months from now, people will be talking about something other than Trayvon Martin. And so black people cannot calm down. We should see Trayvon Martin is all of the other young black males who are being shot and killed every day in the major cities. See, this is a, a direct byproduct of the dynamic of the system of racism. All we have to do, whatever cities have high levels of people shooting each other, and then say, well, what is the level of unemployment amongst young black men? And it'll be 40, 50, 60 percent. And so there's a lot of frustration. They don't understand the system of racism and white supremacy. Nobody is teaching it. You can go to church for a million Sundays, and chances are nobody is talking about racism and white supremacy in the church. 
Now, who was the minister who was talking about racism, white supremacy, and liberation theology? Reverend Jeremiah Wright. And the system made President Obama denounce him. But maybe if people had been talking about what Reverend Jeremiah Wright was talking about and liberation theology, who knows? Maybe there wouldn't have been a Trayvon Martin. Maybe there wouldn't have been some of these other deaths because that message, liberation theology, is just one way of talking about racism, white supremacy, which is what we as black people need to understand. Every black person needs to decide they're going to get a bachelor's, master's, Ph.D., in understanding racism, white supremacy as a system. And as I said before, not so they can spend any time or energy hating white people, but no, so that they can be the champions of helping to produce justice on this planet so there can be peace. And I say justice is a byproduct of self-respect that if we don't respect ourselves, then we will not care about changing destructive and negative conditions that are coming at us. It's just like if a person doesn't have self-respect and somebody says, look, there, you can get AIDS, you can get HIV, and if you're not using protection when you're having sexual relations, you might get infected, and then you can pass it on to somebody else. I say HIV is biological warfare until proven otherwise, just like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment was biological warfare until proven otherwise that the government conducted. So it's very, very important that we decide, wait a minute, we are going to get deeply into the science of black self-respect, and we are going to understand the system of racism, white supremacy, and we are going to be like Dr. Martin Luther King when he said, drum major for justice. See, even that, the system took his message and started talking about the dream, the dream. That when you are dreaming, you are asleep. When you're daydreaming, you're not in touch with what's going on in the world around you. Dr. Martin Luther King said he wanted to be known. Should he pass on, he would want to be known that he was a drum major for justice, fighting racism, white supremacy, ending war. So... I think, I am not at all despondent as to whether we can accomplish the task in front of us. But we, we are not going to accomplish it if we don't see it clearly. That's like if somebody doesn't, you know, somebody's going to school. They may be going to nursery school. They have to start thinking about, I'm going to be graduating from nursery school to go on to kindergarten. They have to be thinking about, the child has to be thinking about, when I finish nursery school, I'm going to go to the next step, go to kindergarten. And when I go to kindergarten, I'm going to graduate uh, from elementary school. And then I'm going to go to high school. And then I'm going to go to college. And what I'm going to do is study in order to become X, Y, Z, so I can make a contribution to myself, my family, and my community and change a system of injustice to a system of justice. And so we have to see and be clear about where we're going. And we have to see clearly. And I say, I've been saying to people, I can hear Trayvon Martin calling to us from the grave and saying, hey, wake up, you all, and start paying attention to the dynamic that killed me and the dynamic that is killing all of these other young black men who are dying by the dozens 
on the streets. And as Trayvon is saying, don't march and sit down. If you feel sorry for me or if you are concerned about my parents, be concerned about all of the other black males who are dying. And be concerned about their parents. And I hear him saying, and all of you all, get into respecting yourselves so that you can stop this kind of criminality that George Zimmerman got involved in, in tracking, just like he was an animal, tracking Trayvon Martin, a child coming home from the store with iced tea and Skittles. And we can learn something very important about the system of racism and white supremacy in the trial. The prosecuting attorney said race wasn't involved. The defense attorney said race wasn't involved. The judge said race wasn't involved. And the six white jurors said race wasn't involved. So that means that all of those people are living with all of their degrees are living in a system of racism, white supremacy, and all of them are engaging in pathological denial. You can't have a room with six people on the jury, six white people, sitting in a room. The defendant is a white male, the victim is a black male, and say they don't understand that racism wasn't even there. Racism was sitting right in that room, and they denied it. I say that's why they were crying. They were crying because they knew they had made an unjust decision. Just like all of the people who sit on TV, all of the hosts and pundits who, oh, race wasn't involved, race wasn't involved. They know race is involved. When they sit on a panel you know, whether it's Meet the Press or one of these other programs, and everybody at the table is white. You mean to tell me they don't think that race is involved? Or you look at a picture of the Congress, and all of the majority of the people are white, you don't think race is involved? When you see black people being removed from cities under gentrification. We don't think race is involved. <laughs> See, I tell people, you know, like Scrabble, get an A-M-E-R-I-C-A. -E get some Scrabble chips. And with that word America, you can make the phrase, I am race. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. Why would that phrase, as an anagram, be in that word, A-N-E-R-I-C-A, -E and each letter will be used only once? So why are there some questions? Context of white supremacy. Uh, I had two questions uh, regarding racial classifications, uh, but I just wanted to share this report uh, to go back to what you were saying about if Trayvon Martin could speak to us uh, from the grave, he would be saying, hey, if you are concerned about me, make sure that you are paying attention to all the other victims of racism that are alive and being terrorized on a daily basis. Uh, racism, white terrorism. Uh, this is... Cody Ingham, uh, this report is written by Ruby Sales. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to read a little bit because this happened uh, in the past seven days. And with all of the outrage that I've heard, justified outrage about uh, Trayvon Martin's killer being acquitted, I really haven't heard anything about this. And this, is, I think, makes your point brutally uh, about what happens every day as a result of white genetic annihilation. Uh, this is written by Ruby Sales. Fear Sa of white genetic annihilation. Thank you. Fear of white genetic annihilation. 
Uh, this is written on July 17th. Uh, Cody Ingham was an 18-year-old black male. He was found hanging from a tree in Athens, Texas on Monday morning, July 15th, 2013. A friend from California gave me this tip and I am on the case. I spoke to Ray Nutt, sheriff of Henderson County, where Athens is located. In our conversation, he confirmed that Cody Ingham was found hanging from a tree Monday morning. Apparently, this incident took place on Sunday, the day after the Zimmerman acquittal. According to the sheriff, Mr. Ingham committed suicide. In telling the story, he said that Mr. Ingham killed himself after he left his girlfriend's house. I asked the sheriff if the girlfriend was white. He said he did not. He said he said he did not readily know the answer and went to look it up. He came back on the he came back on the phone and Dr. Welsing, of course, correct, said she was white. He said Cody and his girlfriend went to a rodeo where they ran into. Oh, that's a Dr. Welsing moment right there. Rodeo. Uh, they went to a rodeo where they ran into her old boyfriend. He said Cody came back very upset and an argument ensued that continued when Mr. Ingham went home with the nameless girlfriend. Mr. Ingham finally told her he was leaving and she never heard from him again. The next morning, she found him hanging from a tree located down her driveway. According to a family source connected to the father, Mr. Ingham called his mother at two in the morning and asked her to pick him up. She called him back, but he did not answer her call. Since this story was not reported in the newspaper, I asked a local editor of the Athens Review why Mr. Ingham's death was only reported as an obituary and not as a story. He mm. said they don't report suicides. Mm. The report mm. continues, but as I said, this is from July 15th, the day after the Zimmerman verdict. And I really have heard very I little. I hope you that to me. Yes, I will do that tomorrow morning. Uh, I have heard very little about this. Do you have any any thoughts on this? I haven't heard it, but again, they the, see the attack when black men were being lynched day in and day out because the accusation was made that they were with a white female, they were thinking about being with a white female, etc. That is an act to prevent white genetic annihilation. And that's why he was lynched and he did not commit suicide. I will wager anyone he did not commit suicide. He was murdered because we are in a system of racism, white supremacy. The other thing that we have to think about is that Trayvon Martin being a 17-year-old person, there are many, many young black people who, because they didn't go through the eras where there were signs, white only, uh, colored, and couldn't go here and couldn't go there, there's freedom to walk around, and maybe because there's a black president, there are many young black people who are saying the people who talk about racism are old school. And uh, racism doesn't exist anymore, and we're really post-racial, and we don't understand why anybody is talking about it. Well, Trayvon Martin can speak to the people in his generation and say, you better wake up. You better wake up, because you don't really understand what is happening. And I hope that my death will wake up young people such as myself. You see, not for the purpose of hating white people and going around and starting fights or setting things on fire. No. Be busy knowing that you can counter racism, white supremacy, by respecting yourself respecting deepest black, what I call crystal black, 
because people who have dark skins and a system of racism and white supremacy, very often they're made fun of. People in their family may make fun of them. Their peers make fun of them. And then you have, the, you know, unaware rap people talking about mixed race and light skin is better than dark skin and all this what I call color sickness. Color sickness, hair sickness, color sickness, feature sickness. Instead of people learning to respect themselves and families learning to respect their children and not name call children based on color, we have to get rid of that sickness that was laid on us by the system of racism, white supremacy. See, these are things that we these are things that we can accomplish. See, these are things that, and during the civil rights movement, when black people had gone through high-level dignity, high-level self-respect, going up against billy clubs and dogs and hoses and death, and they came out of that with black pride, black dignity, talking about black power, and black is beautiful. And I say the system understood, wait a minute, these people are respecting themselves, they have dignity, they have pride, and they're talking about black power and black self-respect. Wow, this is dangerous, because I say self-respect is more powerful than a nuclear weapon. It is more powerful than any nuclear weapon. And so if we decide that these are things that we are going to think about. You see, how do we behave towards ourselves and how do we behave towards one another? And everybody should master Neely Fuller's, you know, behavior code. Stop name-calling, stop gossiping, stop squabbling, stop cursing. Stop being discourteous, stop being disrespectful to one another. Stop stealing from one another, stop robbing one another, stop fighting one another, and stop killing one another. And the ones that I add to it, stop using and selling drugs to one another. See, we're getting ready to be put in a real trap with this legalization of marijuana. So everybody, every black person can be unemployed, and then they can sit in their corner and get high on marijuana with whatever they decide to put in it. And people won't be asking for jobs and being determined that they're going to get jobs and going to get an education. No, everybody can start getting high on marijuana because somebody said it's medicinal and it's legal. What about, so we better beware. What about the people who say the legalization of marijuana is fighting against racism because you have so many black people who are unjustly incarcerated as a result of racist enforcement of these drug laws? So this would be a good thing, and it would keep black people out of greater confinement. No, we can, we can do it by stop using and selling drugs to one another. See, if I'm not using drugs, then I can't be incarcerated for drugs. And I see so many males, young males in my practice who would become psychotic, almost never to return to normal from marijuana use because you don't know what's in it. You don't know how it's been genetically altered. Again, everything has to be put in the context of a power dynamic system of racism and white supremacy. That's one thing the president spoke of, looking at behavior in context. Now, whether he actually meant context, as I say it, I say the context is a system of racism and white supremacy. That's the only way we're going to understand any aspect of our behavior, the power context in which the behavior occurs. Mm. Just for our listeners, because I think that's real important, uh, I had only heard a few people who were saying who had suspicion about this sudden push to 
legalize marijuana and saying, I don't think that this is being done with the best intentions for black people. Uh, you're, are you saying that you you think that this could be something to further erode black people's will and ability to replace white supremacy with justice? So we're just all absolutely. Con- wow. Absolutely. See, they drug test to deny you employment. And so now I'm going to tell you, you can get all the marijuana you want. (laughs) See, we have to say, well, this is interesting. They're legalizing marijuana use, and they're closing schools. They're legalizing marijuana use, but they are making it difficult for black people to vote. They're legalizing marijuana, but they are tightening up on affirmative action. They're legalizing marijuana, but they're making it more difficult to prove discrimination in employment. So again, uh, see, understanding system, and this is how come our brains push black people to say, hey, what's happening? That It's not an idle question. The brain is saying, you don't really understand what's going on. Keep asking, what's happening? What's happening? Maybe somebody will be able to tell you. Because you keep walking in a circle and wondering why things are not improving. Why are the young men, you know, behaving as they are behaving towards each other? Do you see? But if the system makes it difficult for black men to have jobs, a man without a job cannot really play the role of husband and father. Men work. There was a recent report talking about white men committing suicide, and the number of white males committing suicide has increased. And one of the main reasons they gave for an increase in the number of suicides is white men losing their jobs. See, men have to work to feel like they are really a man. Not carrying a sign saying, I am a man. No, to have a job, to be able to be a husband, that's a function. To be able to be a father, that is a function. It's just like a marriage. A marriage is fundamentally a business. People have to have income to pay a mortgage, to pay rent, to buy food, to buy clothing. So there has to be a monetary base. But the system would prefer to spend $40,000, $50,000 a year putting a black man in prison than giving him a job. He could have a job building the infrastructure and be paid $40,000 a year. He can support himself, support a wife, and take care of two children. So so why does the system prefer to see him locked up, to see his genetic material locked up, to see him in a cell and in a prison, becoming a female sexual partner? See, these are the things that we, if I could wave a magic wand, black people would not be singing and dancing until, you know, every black person has Ph.D. in singing and in dancing, popping fingers, rocking back and forth. So we need to stop and stand still and think. I turned on a church program and the black people are swaying and shouting. And do you see somebody in <laughs> from someplace else will look and say, "Are those people insane? That looks like Jonestown." Now people can get all wrapped up in fervor. Do you see if they're being stressed 
by a system they don't understand. And I'm not criticizing religion. I'm baptized Baptist under the water. And christened AME. But I'm talking about what a system that we are yet to understand what the system is doing to us. So I don't think I finished the list. Okay. Uh, stop using and selling drugs to one another. Stop making black children think that as children they can be adequate mothers and fathers. Stop uh, throwing down trash where black people live, work, and play. Stop believing in welfare, believe in prosperity. Stop denying that racism, white supremacy exists. Stop allowing black, brown, red, and yellow people being divided by the system of racism, white supremacy. Context of white supremacy. Again, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, racial classifications. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of the, most of the reports that I've seen, uh, and I could be misinformed, but most of the reports that I've seen with regards to the jurors in the Zimmerman verdict, they've mm -hmm. said that it was five white women and one Latina female uh, saying that she was, the Latina was non-white. Um, but you said earlier that it was six white women. Is it your understanding that it was all white women on the jury, six white women? Well, do, do you see, did the Hispanic person classify themselves as white? See, George uh, Zimmerman is called a Hispanic. He classifies himself as white. So if I give myself a white classification, that also controls how I'm thinking. See, proof that you're white is willingness to kill black. But they're not. So do you have information that the juror number six, see, Hispanic doesn't tell us anything other than they speak Spanish. How do they classify themselves racially? Like I have heard, like I said, most of the reports, they have just said five white and the other one was Latino. And Hispanic. Right. They've either used Latino or Hispanic. I have heard some uh, reports, however, where they have just said, they said the same thing you did, that it was six white women on the jury, um, which is why I've told folks that that, you know, point of confusion there because they haven't, and I don't know what she looks like. So See, I that was just a trick for black people. Hmm. <laughs> With regards to Mr. Zimmerman, uh, do you think other white people accept him as white? Well, you see, I say that the Hispanics, all this discussion about illegal immigration, I say that the system of racism and white supremacy is bringing in tens of thousands of Hispanics who may, even though they may have tan or brown skin, they want to think of themselves as white and better than black people. So with whites becoming, you know, the white people will say non-Hispanic whites, meaning real white people, but they will accept Hispanics calling themselves white, so they will bolster the so-called white numbers. But they will still be looking at what is real white and what is uh, non-Hispanic white in what is so-called Hispanic white, which from their vantage point, they will say is non-white, but they will, you know, in other words, you will be an honorary white for useful purposes. And so a buffer will have been put in place between white and black. So you keep the darkest people, black people, according to the white genetic survival color code. If you are black, get back. If you are brown, stick around, yellow, mellow, white, right. So if they said we are going to flood in uh, so-called Hispanics because we will, you know, use them to support the white classification population. 
and they will be in the middle as a buffer, and we can push the blacks back. So do we think that they're going to come out and say that? They don't even uh, admit that racism and white supremacy is going on. So that's not going to be stated. That's why we have to think as black people. Stop singing and dancing and start thinking. Wow. Thinking and reading. I say reading is more important than watching TV. And not getting addicted to looking at those small uh, iPhone screens. See, where you were getting custom to looking there in a narrow space as opposed to paying attention broadly to what is happening around you. See, and people are getting addicted. That's why some people got, <laughs> tragically are getting hit by automobiles because they won't even stop looking long enough to look and see what way the traffic is flowing. Wow, that I hope folks were uh, listening. Huge point right there. Uh, getting folks addicted to looking in a very narrow manner and not having a broad out view of the world. Very important point. Um, do you, I forgot you are in the D.C. area, and I we played this news report yesterday there was a march uh in dc on monday and this in fact i can read the title of the report this was on npr uh it's immigration reform takes jobs away from black workers and they had a black female she was being interviewed they said she was at this uh rally on monday where they were opposing the reform to the immigration to legalize so-called uh illegal immigrants and she was saying that the this bill basically is just going to take away a lot of jobs from black people and make it more difficult for particularly lower skilled black workers to get jobs because you'll have this influx of people who are willing to work uh, for free. And she was saying that this is just going to harm black people and we should do this. And I even thought, wow, on this week and this was on Monday. So this was the first business day after the, the Zimmerman verdict. Uh, they have this report. And they were saying that, and in fact, they started it, words, they started that they said, uh, this black female who's given the interview says that she's not a racist. And I just thought, wow, this is really interesting. What are your, what are your thoughts? Did you, were you aware of this rally that took place Monday in D.C.? No, I, I was aware of uh, one of the articles, but I wasn't aware that there, you know, that there was a march. But see, the system also... Well, this is, what did I say in the stops, the last stop allowing black, brown, red, and yellow people being divided by racism and white supremacy? It's the system of white supremacy that is flooding in the Hispanics because they have less color and they're appear, they are felt to be less of a threat, but they still are classified as non-white people. And so then black people and Hispanic people are supposed to fight and squabble with each other. And black and Hispanic gangs are supposed to be fighting each other. And that's going to help white supremacy stay in power. And that's why it's in the context. No, if black people do not have jobs, it is a system of racism, white supremacy that has decreed that, just like the system of racism and white supremacy decreed that we were going to be enslaved for hundreds of years. Mm. Uh, so black people's position, they don't care who else has a job, but they're going to have jobs. And instead of, like I say, instead of paying $40,000 a year for a prison cell, $50,000, $60,000 for a prison cell. No, I want to work. And I'm going to be a master worker. 
but I demand that I have a job. And I'm not going to fight with Hispanics about having a job. If you brought them in, you give them jobs, fine. But I want a job. I'm the so-called minority who has seniority. <laughs> mm. I want to make sure I get uh, calls from our listeners. Uh, the number to dial is 760-569-7673. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you have a question for Dr. Welsing. Uh, the number again, 760-569-7676. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you have a question. Uh, last thing before I hit the phone lines, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, and I saw Melissa Harris Perry, she's a non white female. Uh, her program yesterday, they spent most of it talking about racism and the Zimmerman acquittal. And Mr. Timothy Wise, admitted racist, was on the panel. And a lot of listeners had been saying they had been seeing him, same thing you said, all over the place on CNN and all these different programs talking about quote unquote. Uh, white privilege. And it hasn't just been uh, Timothy Wise. It's been quite a few different white people that I've seen, so-called liberal white people or white people who say they're well-meaning, saying, oh, yes, racism, this was a travesty and this was horrible what happened. And of course, Mr. Zimmerman should be in jail. And of course, racism is still a big problem. And that's why this happened. Uh, in fact, I even saw two different white people. Uh, Bill Maher on Friday, he came out and he said, if he had been a black person, he would not have handled this as well as black people. He said he would have been out in the streets and tearing up things. And there was another white person, uh, Dave Simon. He has a really popular uh, television program and uh, he's done lots of television movies. Uh, he said, if I was a black person, I would have been throwing bricks at the courthouse. And I just wanted your comment on all of the or it's been a significant number of white people like Tim Wise out speaking, giving the impression that they're really outraged and upset about this. Uh, what are your thoughts about the role? See, every black person should know that Tim Wise says he's a racist. Is that right? It's ma'am. It's in the archives. He said it on the air. OK. Do, do you see? So the question is, why would uh CNN or any of the other stations, MSNBC, Melissa Harris Perry, why would they have a white person who says he's a racist, but he is, what, talking about white privilege? See, he's talking about racism in an acceptable way to white people that keeps white people comfortable and not having to think about they are conducting a system for white genetic survivor. What did, what did Tim Wise say about me? Uh, I believe <laughs> that Dr. Welsing is uh, talking pseudoscientific BS. Mm. Is that what he said? In the archives as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you see? So, you know, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. But black people, do you see, black people are more comfortable... Why not have Neely Fuller come on and talk about racism? <laughs> that Doc would be my question. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, author, 40 years <laughs> studying okay. racism. And, 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 and think about this. I'm the only psychiatrist in the United States of America. Physician, specialist in behavior who has been talking about it for 40 years. So one can say, well, wh why isn't a black psychiatrist who's made a study of racism over many decades? No, we do not want any comprehensive discussion of racism, white supremacy. And we certainly don't want a black person who has any in-depth understanding talking about racism and white supremacy. You see, but everybody should just call in the shows and say, well, Tim Wise says he's a racist. 
And do you think, in Tim Wise, he says he's Jewish, is that right? Yes, ma'am. So do you think that a black person would be an expert on TV talking about anti-Semitism? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Mm. Just for the record, uh, has have you received any requests to do any network interviews uh, talking about your book and your view on racism in light of the Zimmerman verdict? Oh, absolutely no. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> just, just no, of course not. Of course not. Francis Welsing talks about racism being related to white tiny minority status on the planet which is something people who classify themselves as white do not want to talk about, do not want to think about. And I talk about white being a genetic recessive trait. And if necessary, I could talk about ball games. There was uh, Malcolm uh, Gladwell, um, a black writer, was talking about football should be banned in the colleges because of traumatic brain encephalopathy, you know, encephalopathy. Um, and I, I thought that was interesting. You know, young people, high school people getting their heads hit or hitting their heads against other players, and that can cause brain damage. And I thought to myself, now... Banning football would be the same thing as banning guns because the ball games play out at the subconscious symbolic level. Black males at football, black male, big brown balls going through some white upright legs. And this is important critical symbolism that gives white males a chance to, you know, white males are playing football, or from the other side, white males in the stands watching black men toss the brown balls through the white upright legs. So I don't know if people follow that, but read the ISIS papers. Keys to the colors. Um, one of uh, another black male doing as much as he can to replace white supremacy with justice uh, because he co-hosts Reckless 2.0. Uh, he sent me a newspaper article. This is from uh, 1995. Do you remember uh, about almost 20 years ago at this point, do you remember when you had uh, a debate with the author of The Bell Curve, uh, Dr. Murray? Uh, this yeah, was, okay. Charles Murray, right. They have, this is in the from the Toledo Blade from uh, January oh, right. 14th. Okay. Night. They said, uh, I just, this is astounding for many reasons. Uh, they said that Ronald Price, co owner of R&D Cultural Bookstore, added that Dr. Welsing was the person to set the record straight on the bell curve. She brought out the reality about racism in America. The university paid Dr. Murray $12,000 and Dr. Welsing $7,000 to appear yesterday. Is that, is that accurate? Um, that, yeah, that might be accurate. Right. Mm hmm. I told Vickers. I mean, I didn't know what he was being paid. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> would that I had known? Would I would love to see a copy of that? I never saw that. I think we can take care of that too. That should not be okay, a problem. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I will go ahead and hit the phone line, uh, Justice. If you have some questions, uh, your line should be open. The other folks, if you have questions, again, the number is seven six zero. Five six nine seven six seven six, and the code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you have questions. Uh, Justice, your line should be open. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Greetings, Doctor Welsing. Uh, glad for you uh, to be on uh, to uh, be on uh, this evening. Good evening to you. Mm -hmm. um, at one point in time in your life, uh, did you ever think of racism not being white supremacy? Uh, 
I may have thought about, well, you know, thought about racism always in relationship to how white people were relating to black people. But I didn't tie racism as clearly directly with uh, white supremacy as Neely Fuller has done. You see, so I always knew that racism had to do with how black people were being treated by people who classify themselves as white. But Neely Fuller has nailed it down so that racism is white supremacy and white supremacy is racism. And there is not any other racism that is dominant on planet Earth at this time. So black people, for example, black people would say, if a black person stood on the corner and said all kind of negative things about white people for 24 hours a day, they still do not have the power to determine what happens in white people's lives. But white people have the power to determine what happens in black people's lives. So racism is a power dynamic. It's not somebody just calling names. How uh, did you figure out that racism and white supremacy are synonyms? Wait a minute, say that again. How did you figure out that racism and white supremacy are synonyms? Well, as I said, in other words, racism is a behavior. If, if a person, if I use the word racism, I wasn't thinking about black people's behavior towards each other. And so Neely Fuller just pulled the white supremacy and racism and tied it together as clarification for what it is that we are talking about. You see, you know, let's say, um, well, I don't, I, I don't know. I never even thought about um, when Dr. Du Bois in 1903, when uh, he wrote his book, Souls of Black Folks, and he said the problem of the 20th century is a question of the color line. So Dr. Du Bois used color line speaking about white supremacy. That was the term that he used. And so Neely Fuller pulled the two words together, white supremacy, and tied it to racism. And I think that that has been exceedingly uh, effective for purposes of clarification so that black people don't start saying, if a black person said they hated white people, they're not a racist. They're just a black person saying they hate white people, calling white people names, maybe. But they don't have power over white people's lives. Were you uh, ever scared or um, uncomfortable talking about racism, white supremacy? I don't think so. No, why? What do you have in mind? Um, like, because uh, I know that, like, a lot of people, like, um, especially a lot of uh, non-white people, um, like, uh, if a non-white person is talking about racism, white mm -hmm. supremacy, and, um, um, around other non-white people, then they uh, can sometimes tend to, like, look around and see if uh, anyone is listening, um, mm. especially white people. So, uh, yeah, um, I was just curious if uh, Well, if, I didn't uh, understand what you're talking about. But I grew up in a household where my parents were very political. My father was a physician and my mother was a teacher. And my father's father was a physician, and he died in 1909. But my grandmother, his wife, lived in the home with us, and she would always say in speaking about her husband, your grandfather was a race man. Now, that terminology meant that he focused on race first, the importance of people identifying with the group that they are a part of. 
He wasn't interested in escaping being a black man. So I grew up in a household where, as I said, my parents were very political people and always talking about um, the issues impacting white people or the impact impacting black people based on what uh, white people were doing to black people. I remember my parents and grandmother, they would be standing around reading the newspaper and if a black man, because when I grew up, I was born in 1935, and so when I grew up, all the black newspapers, whenever a black man would be lynched, it would be headlines in the black newspapers in the major cities and maybe even in the smaller cities. And so that is the atmosphere that I grew up in and grew up with parents who were focusing on what were the issues impacting black people. So again, I was never uncomfortable thinking about or talking about what was happening to black people and race. Sorry, uh, As a matter of apologize. fact, I'm thinking about my godmother who was a Chicago public school teacher. Her husband was a lawyer, and Richard Wright wrote some a black boy in her, in when he was in her house. So that's the kind of atmosphere that I grew up in. And parents taking you to see Dr. Du Bois if he came to the city speaking, or taking you to see Paul Robeson. Hmm. Um, the, uh, to unconfuse a non-white person about racism, white supremacy, what would be a, a <clears throat> what would be a constructive question to ask them? Mm -hmm. For for someone who has who doesn't want to talk about uh, racism. Are you thinking about that or what? Um, first, if you guys want to, uh, probably like um, a person who uh, who wants to talk about racism but like doesn't understand it. Well, then uh, I would start. Uh, if they say they want to understand racism, I would say, well, this is my definition. Let me share it with you, and let's sit down and have a cup of coffee, and I will explain further what I think is happening on uh, in this area of the world and happening on this planet, and this is why it is happening, and talk about white sphere of genetic annihilation and determination for white genetic survival and say that all of the problems that black people are facing are tied to this dynamic and that if we understand this, we will have greater insight into all of the problems that we face in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And so if we want to function effectively, we have to understand what is happening in the greater context, in the power context that surrounds us. And so then you might ask the person, are there any things that you worry about? What do you worry about most? You see, in almost anything the person says, you can tie mm -hmm. it to racism, white supremacy as a power dynamic. Like if I ask you, what do you think the person might say that is a problem that they, uh, they see or that they're facing? Hypothetically speaking, what would you think they might say? Um, you think maybe you can rephrase that? Because I 
So you're I talking to this sure. person that you said that they want to understand racism, but they don't really understand it. And so you ask the person, is there anything that you are really concerned about? Or is there anything that you're really worried about? So if someone were to ask you, what are you most concerned about? Or what are you most worried about? What would you say? Um, If I was a uh, confused person? No, just your person. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. Um, uh, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I really don't know. <laughs> well, see, so you have to think of a hypothetical person. I mean, in other words, if I were to say to you, what are the three most important things that black people worry about, what would you say? Your experience with other black people or your experience with what you've read about black people, what would you say are the three things that they're most worried about? Um, probably... Uh... Uh, uh, um, Do you think people are worried about jobs? Do you think people are worried yeah. about education? Do you think people are worried about housing? Do you think yes, they're worried I... about their children maybe being educated? Yes. Well, you think if they read that article about a black man being lynched, you see, well, they might say, wow, I wonder why that happened. Or if they read about Trayvon being shot in the heart. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of black people who've got high blood pressure even looking at the trial and certainly listening to the verdict. So people... You know, we live in a society, we live in a world, and people have, if they're thinking about anything, they might bring up some topic, you see, or uh, as a psychiatrist. I mean, a woman was in my office and talking about her son was falsely arrested by police and how upset she got because several years ago her other son was killed. Mm. These are the everyday experiences of black people. Yes, that is uh that is totally true. Um you say that uh, non-white people have to talk about white supremacy in order to get rid of it, to replace it with something better. If uh, that's the case, uh, then how do you go about trying to get more and more um, non-white people talking about racism, white supremacy? Um, with programs such as this one, people who may have uh, radio or blog programs and they ask people to come on and talk about serious subjects and so I don't know what number of listeners might be tuned in to such a program as this but I would imagine a number of people tune in and so if somebody is talking about something relevant and one person might um, be at lunch tomorrow at work and they might end up saying I heard an interesting discussion uh, yesterday and they will share an idea with somebody else 
Right there's an African proverb, each one teach one. So word word is spread. I was surprised the other day, I uh, Friday, I walked out of uh, my driveway and there were men working on the street, you know, in hard hats and they were doing something, digging up the roadway. And so they had those orange cones in front of my driveway. So I went to ask them if they could move a couple of the cones so I could come out of my driveway. And um, the gentleman said, sure. And so then he looked at me and he said, are you Dr. Welsing? Now this is somebody in a hard hat working on the road. And he said, I thought I recognized you. Let me shake your hand. Thank you for all the work that you're doing to help our people. So how did that man know? I don't know. <laughs> Do you see? But it's like, so, you know, I've been talking about racism a lot for a long time. And um, so you talk and if people find what you say, to be helpful or helping them understand, then, you know, they will keep that information. The man said, I read your book. I can't wait till I tell my wife that I saw you. So it's not like personal importance. It's a matter of somebody found that you may have said something or I said something that they found useful or helping them understand. So the most important thing is programs like this where you have somebody who has uh, a mechanism to reach out and put ideas. See, we're not laughing and clowning and trying to crack dirty jokes. We're talking about the problem of injustice or self-respect or black people uh, understanding what is going on around them and how we can uh, turn around this unjust system that has existed for 500 years. See, even if something simple, if black people, if the black people who hear my voice, if it's 50 people, if it's 30 people, if it's 10 people, and I said, what we're going to do is we are going to elevate the color crystal black. That means the very blackest people we're going to put at the top of the scale of respect and beauty. Now that will shock white supremacy because one of the major teachings is to say that black is bad and black is ugly and to attack and then train black people to attack each other based on color and to glorify in the fact that uh, our great-grandmothers were raped by the white slave master. That's how people get light skin. So by having insight and say, we're going to turn this thing upside down. See, white people will be shocked because what do white people want? They want to get the darkest tan possible when they are all dressed up, when they are in their most sophisticated dress. What color do they have on? I'm asking you a question. Do you know? Sorry about that, uh, my mute button. Um, probably, no, when uh, white black. people are in their most sophisticated dress, they have on black. Yes, black. All important occasions, they put on black. They say black is the most sophisticated color, but they train black people to call each other ugly 
based on the level of darkness of their skin. Whereas they say in the Sudan, the blackest people have the most wisdom. But those are just ideas about countering racism and white supremacy. If you uh, had to break down what racism, white supremacy is to a nine-year-old confused black person, uh, what would you say or what are some of the things you would say? For a young person, I would teach them to admire their color and to see the beauty in the most color black. And they might say, well, why? I say, first of all, it's important to see your own beauty and to understand that we are black people. And if our great-grandparents hadn't been raped, we would still be dark-skinned black people. And so whereas we're going to respect all of the colors, the last thing we're going to do is to denigrate most black. That we're going to put it on the highest pedestal. First of all, because the creator of the universe made black people the first people. And so under white supremacy, we have been taught to hate most black, but the creative force of the universe made us the mothers and fathers of everybody and made us most black. So for any black person who says they're spiritual, well, they might even say they're religious and they believe in God as a creative force. Well, if God or the creative force made us black and then I hate black, then it's like me spitting in the eye of God, or spitting in the eye of the creator of the universe. Why do you um, say that? I'm going uh, to have, have to go shortly. Okay. Okay. What, one last question, yes? Um, why do you say that self-respect uh, is more powerful than a nuclear weapon? And what do you mean when you say that? Because it is. Can you think anything is more important than you respecting yourself? I'm sorry? I say, can you think of anything that's more important than you respecting yourself? No. That's why I say it. See, if you don't respect sense. yourself, nobody else can respect you. So it's not money that makes a person really powerful. It's whether they value and respect themselves and extend that to valuing and respecting the people who look like them. Well, I'm going to have to go. Is this okay. the time that we can sign off? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I know uh, other folks listening in appreciate you uh, being able to take some of your time Did out. Did you have any other calls? I can give you 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, we do have other folks. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We, uh, If we're doing 15, everybody, if you can just do one quick question, that way we can try and get as many folks as possible. Uh, 2658, 2658, did you have a question for Dr. Welsing? Yes, sir. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, Dr. Welsing. Greetings. Uh, what is your take on... on, uh, on White uh, retort on on the present day. You know, there's a lot of talking about racism now, and uh, and uh, white saying that uh, black people kill kill each other in mass. Black people kill more whites than white than whites kill blacks. 
most black kids are, are born out of wedlock, therefore they they don't uh, have fathers uh, being parents. Uh, why why you 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 uh, black people can't get out of your own way? Uh, this, I, I'm hearing a lot of this. Uh, 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 whether it's on the comment section on the uh, on the on websites uh, or in general on the radio, television, what have you, as far as retort with all the uh, the the talk now uh, on the subject of racism. What what what, what would be your well? Take let on? me say this. I see. I would say that that is a diversion discussion. In other words, black people. Uh, because of the outcome of the tr of the uh, trial, they started addressing racism, and so this is the critical topic that the system of racism, white supremacy, cannot talk about or refuses to talk about because that is a close examination of the behavior of the people who classify themselves as white. So that, that's the last thing that they want to have scrutinized. And so black people uh, came out of listening to the verdict in the George Zimmerman trial and talking about racism because of the verdict that was rendered. And so immediately... Well, let's start talking. Let's not talk about a person who classified himself as white who killed a black teenager. Let's talk about why are so many black young men shooting and killing each other. Now, the answer to that is, as I said earlier, that it is the unemployment of black males, the high level, beyond depression level unemployment, the high level of frustration that young men feel if there's no place for them in the society other than going to prison. And so when people are feeling I'm nothing, see, racism white supremacy is the highest form of violence that exists on planet Earth. It's really the highest form of terrorism that is being directed at black people in general and black male persons in particular. And so when a person is being attacked, that's like, uh, let's say, a man on a job and he wants to keep his job, but he's attacked by the boss. So he cannot attack the boss, but he comes home and either kicks his dog or kicks his wife or hits his wife, meaning he lets out the frustration on other people who are vulnerable, but he couldn't let out the frustration against the boss because he wants to try to keep his job. And so this is where black-on-black -black violence comes from, the high level of frustration. Black males are the number one target of attack in the system of racism and white supremacy. It has been so, and this is why I say that this, we have to understand racism is a total system structure for white genetic survival and preventing white genetic annihilation. Well, who is the threat to white genetic survival? It's the black male. It's the black male who has the powerful genetic material to cause white genetic annihilation. Now, women can have genetic material also, but they cannot impose sexual intercourse. Only men can impose sexual intercourse. So if your, if your fear is genetic annihilation, then you attack the threat. So the report that uh, was just mentioned about the black male who was going with a white female and they came back from socializing, and he ended up 
being hung. This is just a repeat of the history of black people being black men being lynched and castrated. So it's a diversionary discussion, but it is also important for black people to put in context why are there all of these killings done by black male persons. They're depressed, they're frustrated, because they have no jobs. They cannot function as men because they don't have jobs. Now, they can have sex, but they can't take care of the product. They can't function as husbands and pay the rent or pay half the rent if they don't have jobs. So this is very high-level frustration, but then the system will say, what I'll do is I'll bring drugs to your community. And you don't have a job, well, here are your drugs. You can sell drugs. Here are your guns. So if your deal goes bad, then you can shoot and kill each other so you can help me get rid of you. I don't have to kill all of you. I'm signing you all up to kill each other. And that will facilitate white genetic survival. So we have to understand what this game is. And it really isn't that complicated to understand. If we allow ourselves to turn off the loud music and to use our brains and think and try to ask the creative force to give us the courage to talk about this critical topic that is the most dangerous thing to talk about in the system of racism, white supremacy. But that's where self-respect comes in, because self-respect will help the courage come forward. Self-respect will help annihilate the fear. Because fear is normal. Anything that is perceived as a threat, it's okay to be afraid of it. But if you have to move beyond your fear, then you have to use your self-respect and your courage. That's why the Attorney General, Black Attorney General Eric Holder, early on in his administration, in his tenure in that position as the first Black Attorney General, he said, are we a nation of cowards being unable to talk about racism? Are we a nation of cowards? And he wasn't just talking about black people. He was talking about all people because we are in a system of racism, racism, white supremacy, which is run consciously and or subconsciously by people who classify themselves as white. And as black people, we are the victims of the system. But everybody, you know, the people who classify themselves as white, they may be afraid or just strategically don't want their hands revealed. But I think I'm going to have to go. Thank you again, Dr. Welsing. Uh, it was a Thank treat to hear from me. you. Uh, take excellent care, and we will hope to be in touch with you soon. Okay, very good. Thank you again. Good evening, good Dr. Day. Welsing. Mm -hmm. Bye. Context of white supremacy. I uh, hope folks got constructive information. Uh, always good to hear from Dr. Welsing, uh, 19th visit to the program. She had so many uh, constructive things to say. Uh, shocking about uh, even the iPhone screens. Uh, man, having that narrow vision of things. Um, man, super important. Uh, the, the When she was talking about the marijuana legalization, I thought that was incredibly important as well. It even reminded me one of our uh, previous guests. She's a black female uh, attorney. Uh, prosecutor. Uh, she's a local prosecutor here in Washington State, and she was on the program and 
Tuere Salah, that's her name. Uh, when she was on the program, I asked her about the legalization and she shared a few comments. Uh, but when the program ended, I was talking to her to thank her for sharing her time. And she said, oh, man, I forgot. I meant to say that I also think that they're going to go really aggressive in prosecuting black males uh, once they are accused of selling uh, drugs. If they I think in the states where it's legal, you can have an ounce and anything overall. Uh, an ounce if they determine that it was intent to distribute uh, that you were going out and trafficking uh, that they are going to bang you really hard and she said that we were off the air I was like oh man that was <laughs> important to get on but she said that she thought that was going to be another way uh, the driving component I think she touched on that on the program and saying that she thought with what they call it really accurately should be driving under white terrorism as a non-white person uh, she was saying that the driving component where they passed the, the law saying that if you're under the influence while you're driving, she thought they were going to be really aggressive on black people on that end. And then on the you're a seller, uh, she said she thinks that this means they're going to have zero lenience. Uh, if you are charged with trafficking, selling marijuana, it's over an ounce. You are going to get banged up if you are a black person. I think that's probably true as well. But I've heard very few people uh, express what our, uh, Dr. Welsing said around legalization of marijuana being another ploy to weaken black people, victims of racism, so that we do not have the will ability to establish justice, put white people out of business. Real important point. Um, folks that dialed in uh, who are on the line with questions. Sorry, she had to uh, go out a little early. I know there were a lot of other folks who had questions that they wanted to get in. Hopefully, we'll be able to have her back for uh, visit number 20. And um, be sure to get in your questions, comments, what have you. Uh, hopefully, though, the information was still good. Um, always good. I always feel like it's, it's a great learning opportunity when she visits the program. Uh, with that, we will be on the program tomorrow evening. Uh, we should have down in California. Um, make sure I get the name correctly. Uh, I think we have listeners in the California area who have talked about uh, KPFK and KPFA, uh, the two public radio stations uh, in the California area. And on KPF, I think it's KPFA is the one that's uh, in Oakland. I think KPFK is the one that's in Southern California. Uh, but on KPFA, they have uh, Mr. JR, black male. Uh, he hosted a program all about racism, white supremacy, and of course, massive difficulties from the white people who are in charge of the station. And he got suspended. Uh, he was writing about this online and he made a great comparison. He was saying that he had made a request to talk. There's a prison strike that's been going on in California. Uh, he had made a request to do a program where they focused on what the strike is about, what the prisoners are requesting, what the response has been to the strike. Uh, he was going to go over all these details. I think he was making a request for like three and a half hours to do a program to lay all this out for the California audience. And he said that the station, white people at the station, racist suspects, hadn't responded, that the, the request had just been sitting dormant. And he said in the meantime, now he was only asking for three and a half hours. In the meantime, white people concerned with gay rights got a 10 and a half hour block of time to talk about gay rights and their problems. 10 and a half hours, three and a half hours. And he didn't even get the three. <laughs> they got 10 and a half. He got nothing. He said even as, as this article was published this month, he still hadn't heard anything uh, regarding the request just to do, you know, a little three and a half hour program on this prison strike. And this is a big deal. I've heard a lot of people talking about this. At any rate, we will be talking about all of that tomorrow on the program at 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, 7 p.m. Central and 5 p.m. Pacific. I know we do have a significant chunk of listeners uh, in the California area. I'm sure they have heard from Mr. J.R., Minister of Information uh, at KPFA. I'm sure some of our California listeners have heard him. Should be good to have him on the broadcast and to get more of the details about exactly what they were doing to him at the station to kind of get him off the air. Uh, at any rate, uh, we will wrap things up again. My bad to listeners who dialed in, weren't able to get their questions. I was hoping she would be able to hang out with us a little bit longer to uh, take in a question or two from some of the other folks. But 
Next time, hopefully, we'll have a little bit more time. We'll make sure to get your questions in. Again, we'll be back tomorrow. Thanks, everyone, for listening to the broadcast. Invest if you think the program is constructive. Share. Post it online. You can put it on Twitter, Facebook. If you have a blog, uh, they're easy, embeddable little widgets and players where people can listen to the information right on your page. They don't have to leave. You can still get all your hits and numbers. And if you think the information is constructive, if there are other programs, other content, anything that you think would be helpful for non-white people to get a better grasp of what racism, white supremacy means and suggestions, things that we can do to put racist man, racist woman, racist child out of business Get that information out there. Do not just be a suspect, uh, excuse me, a spectator. Uh, Take that energy, take that frustration, take that anger out of all of this and look for things that you can do. Uh, Even if it's just things on a local level in your area, look for things that you can do. Uh, We're all supposed to be on our assignment, trying to get as many people as we can uh, less confused, more informed about racism, white supremacy, as Dr. Welsing said. You have some sympathy. You have some feelings about Trayvon Martin and the injustice that happened there. Don't just sit on it. Don't just be a spectator. Use that as motivation to get out and do something constructive. Constructive. Thanks all for tuning in. Context of white supremacy signing out. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cows signing out. I'm a victim, brother. A victim. Shut I'm a victim up. of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>